Hi, everyone. My name is Jacob Lieberman, and I'm a field product manager for OpenStack, and I work for Red Hat. And I just want to welcome all of you to Austin. Uh, I actually live here in Austin, and it's very exciting to me to see everybody here um, in Austin. There's a long list of wonderful cities where they have these conventions, Vancouver, Tokyo, Paris, and it's just amazing to me that Austin's one of them. So um, welcome, and thank you for coming. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is that uh, I coach my kids' sports teams. You know, um, in Texas, it's all about football, but uh, I coach rugby, actually, for those, you know, folks here from over the pond. Yep, I see the Betfair folks. The, um, I was coaching them over the weekend, and I lost my voice. So a good sense of humor will be essential for this presentation. Uh, if you work with OpenStack, I'm sure you have a good sense of humor already. So, yeah, thank you. So <laughs> I'll be here all week. So. Um, Let's get started. Uh, luckily, I don't have to do the heavy lifting for this presentation. We're very lucky to be joined by my co-presenters, <clears throat> or as I call them, the talent. First of all, we have John Quigley from Oak Ridge National Lab. For those of you that don't know, Oak Ridge is one of the premier Department of Energy research labs in the United States, and they do a lot of forward-looking work around um, scientific computing and technology. So, uh, and John is actually the leader, of the technical lead for their cloud plus HPC, high performance computing integration team. Um, I am an old HPC nerd myself from my time at Dell and AMD, so I am, thank you, <laughs> I'm very excited to hear what John has to say. And then also we have Richard, uh, Richard Haig with uh, Betfair. Betfair is the world's um, largest internet betting exchange. Uh, and he's the global head of reliability and operations. So you may have heard Richard present already earlier today, correct, or not yet? Not yet. Okay, not yet, I'm sorry. Coming later. So this is a preview of what you'll get later. My clicker's not working, so I have to move back and forth. Here's the agenda. Um, very quickly, I'm going to introduce you to the topic and the themes and then move out of the way so we can hear from our presenters who we're so lucky to have. Uh, the name of this talk is Going Beyond OpenStack, and I think that is kind of an odd title because, after all, we're here for the OpenStack Summit, right? So, ostensibly, this talk begins where the summit ends. We're going beyond OpenStack. And, uh, understandably, it's perhaps not entirely clear to all of you or even to our presenters when I approach them what they should talk about. So, I'm going to share the two themes I gave to them uh, to help kind of scaffold and guide their talk. Um, I'm going to share those with you as well to just kind of uh, set the stage for their discussion. I'll get it. <laughs> Is that my phone? Okay, and I should move through this very quickly. So first of all, um, there's an old saying, right? If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Similarly, for many OpenStack operators, uh, we believe that everything can be solved by OpenStack and the software that it includes. And uh, when you're confronted with a nail, it's great to have a hammer. However, sometimes you might need one of these or one of those. Right, that's a drill and a stethoscope. So um, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is kind of a, a message you hear a lot from Red Hat. We're actually a full software stack enterprise software vendor, so we can we have software to solve problems at the very top of the stack. And I know this is a very marketing-y slide. I, I promise it's the last one. But we have management software at the very top. We can help you with that. We can help you with your PaaS, the infrastructure it runs on, the hypervisor, the operating system, all the way down to the cruftiest, oldest parts of the kernel where you might need help. Because you'll often find when you're working with OpenStack that you might trip a problem or trip a bug that's not actually a problem with OpenStack itself, but at a lower level. And when you reach a problem with that, you need that lower level expertise to see you through. So um, what the theme that I asked them to talk about was similar to when you're uh, holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but the hammer's not always the appropriate tool for the job. What challenges, what business challenges have you solved with OpenStack? And what challenges do you need other tools to solve? And what were they? So that's the going beyond OpenStack part. So that's number one. Um, incidentally, when people talk about OpenStack and they compare it to a tool, this is the one I uh, frequently hear mentioned, which is a Swiss Army knife, 
right? So we have a, a package of discrete tools that are bundled together and each one is well suited for a single purpose. The, um, I think a better analogy is this, right? So that's a spork. It looks kind of funny from here, but uh, so a spork combines functions from different tools, but when you combine them in a new way, it enhances the capability to use both of them together. You don't need separate utilities to both spear and spoon your food. You have them both here. And so they multiply and complement the capabilities of one another. They're not discrete tools like what we have here. So from now on, when people ask you what OpenStack is, say it's a spork. It'll make perfect sense to everyone. <laughs> Thank you. OK, good. So the second theme um, that I asked them to talk about was, uh, and this goes along with the story you're going to hear a lot about at OpenStack Summit, which is digital transformation. But um, this is the first line from Anna Karenina, which is a, a famous um, Russian novel uh, by Leo Tolstoy. And he says, this is the first sentence of the book, all happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Now, what does this have to do with OpenStack, right? So um, the second theme I asked them to talk about going beyond OpenStack is, is, is this. Wouldn't it be nice if every OpenStack deployment took place in a perfect greenfield where there was no legacy software, there were no traditional boundaries between business units, no politics, no turf wars, uh, no old SAN hardware that you have to figure out how to cram into your software-defined storage. Uh, there are so many things that, that, so many challenges and problems that you might not run into when you're faced with something like this. In a perfect world, we all have this, and all of our applications are perfectly scalable, and we can run them on a cloud without any modification. Right? But in reality, um, it's more like this. So OpenStack usually doesn't exist in a vacuum. Usually as part of a dis, uh, digital transformation, people are moving to OpenStack from somewhere else, uh, from the place where they already live and work. And um, it, it, it comes into an ecosystem of existing technologies, processes, assumptions, personalities, politics, and divisions. The, uh, we see this very frequently. For example, what do your storage, uh, let's say you're at a large financial institution and the storage folks have al always operated the SAN. Well, what happens to those storage folks when now your storage is just an application? Similarly with the networking. Beyond that, you might have this guy, right? This is the guy who, uh, does everyone know what this is? So Office Space. Of course, this movie was filmed in Austin, and you're all here in Austin, so I had to throw it in. I, I hope it's not some kind of um, copyright violation. But you might have traditional uh, political divisions within your organization, and maybe some people who are accustomed to doing things in a more traditional conservative way who just don't really get what Cloud's about, and you have to convince them. You have to find a way to work with them and win them over. And you might also have this guy, right? So you might have this guy. Of course, this is Bill Gates. The, um, all the, uh, you may have to run Windows workloads or workloads from another operating system, another vendor. Oh, of course, these things work on OpenStack now, and we're getting very friendly with Penguins right now. But just by way of example, a lot of the people that are moving to OpenStack maybe are coming from a completely different mindset, which might be VMware, Windows, something like that. So. That all ties into the second theme. The second theme is, you know, in a perfect world, we're deploying into a greenfield environment where all of our applications are ready. But in reality, there are many challenges you might encounter uh, and traditional ways of doing things. So I also asked them to talk a bit about that. Those are also things that go beyond OpenStack. So um, I think we are right on time. And now please allow me to uh, introduce John Quigley. Thank you. All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, before we start, quick show of hands. Who's running OpenStack right now? All right. Not too bad. All right. So you'll, you'll get some of my jokes then, I guess. All right. So let's see here. Am I doing something wrong? It didn't work for me. Didn't work? Okay. Gotcha. 
All right, so hey, I'm, I'm John Quigley. I work at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, Jacob gave a pretty good introduction there a second ago, but uh, I'll, I'll just share a couple things with you. Um, so real quick about me, I'm sort of one of these guys who's worn different hats uh, over his career. You know, sysadmin, cybersecurity developer. Um, as a sysadmin, you kind of have to wear a lot of those hats anyway, but uh, uh, now I find myself in sort of a mix between a tech lead, project manager, sysadmin role. Uh, anyway, about Oak Ridge National Lab, um, it's a really large science and technology laboratory run for the Department of Energy. We're located uh, in the beautiful hills of East Tennessee. We've got about 4,400 employees. Uh, we're spread over about 4,400 acres of land, uh, but we don't each get an acre, unfortunately. That would be nice, some kind of homesteading uh, benefit. But anyway, uh, among the many areas of research that we get into, um, th these are just some of them, and you can see there's a bunch of different kinds of sciences there, from materials to, to neutron, uh, to sort of, sort of more integrated ones like uh, climate science and, and national security. So, um, and also we operate what we call DOE user facilities. So these are uh, world-class facilities that uh, attract thousands of visitors uh, throughout the year. So we have scientists coming from almost every country to come on site, use our computing resources, use our scientific resources. Uh, and of course we have Titan, uh, which is the uh, number one uh, supercomputer for open science right now. Um, there's a computer in China that's, that's a little bigger. Uh, we were number one a couple years ago. I guess they're number one overall, but in some ways they're not as open as we are, so we get to say we're the number one open science supercomputer. All right, go, go USA. So anyway, um, so I mentioned all that stuff because I want to talk about um, I want to talk about OpenStack in the context of what we do uh, at the lab. So um, sometimes it's hard to know, you know, what is a solved problem in OpenStack. What what kinds of nails the OpenStack hammer can 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 hit? And, and our journey's been to to try to figure that out. It's it, you know, OpenStack's a broad project. There's a lot of different projects. Uh, there's a lot of promise. There's a lot of things to get excited about. So so our journey has been to kind of figure out which of those pieces we can, you know, integrate into our, into our sort of traditional or legacy uh, compute environment. And of course at Oak Ridge we've been doing compute for a long time, so we have a lot of sort of entrenched views on how to, how to manage clusters and how to manage compute. So, uh, you know, when we first became aware of OpenStack we got very excited and, you know, we were kind of thinking like, oh, single pane of glass, you know, this is something we can use to deploy everything. And there's, there's truth in that, you really can. Um, but it's not always possible or, or maybe always recommended. So as we go through the presentation, I want you to think about three zones that, uh, of the OpenStack ecosystem. So you can have services running inside of OpenStack. These are, these are services that OpenStack spins up and presents to you, right? Yet services running underneath OpenStack. These could be things that, that deploy OpenStack, for example. And then you have services running alongside of OpenStack. And these may be just traditional IT services throughout your organization that, that OpenStack has to integrate into. And so the challenge is obviously to choose wisely. You, you usually have options for where you run something in those three ecosystems. Okay, so um, I want to talk about uh, our customers and uh, kind of why we, you know, their needs and why we chose uh, OpenStack. So we've got um, a lot of scientists. We have, you know, thousands of scientists, and I, I kind of break them down into a couple different categories. We've got the internal ones, the ones we hire. We've got the, the support staff around them, which is a bunch of you know, IT staff, electrical engineers, chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, and then we have uh, all the visiting scientists that I spoke about a few minutes ago. Uh, so here's some, of the, here's some of the challenges that are faced by our customers, uh, some of their expectations, rather, and then, and then the challenges for how we deliver. Uh, data movement, we gotta, we gotta move large amounts of data around from, from the point at which data is created to the point at which it's analyzed. Uh, our researchers have this expectation that there's all this free compute storage out there because we're Oak Ridge, right? We got the supercomputer, you know, give me some time on it, but why can't you guys just give me 100 cores right now? Uh, they expect a fast deployment turnaround, and that's because, you know, things like AWS have kind of raised everybody's expectations, right? Uh, if companies like Netflix can go out there and, and spin up thousands of instances, you know, why can't, why can't we do that too? Uh, our researchers uh, demand high scale. They, they usually need to run over hundreds of thousands, of cores. Uh, they want high throughput, high capacity, low latency I.O., fast, big, everywhere. Um, they expect utility IT, but they want it to also be innovative, and that's, of course, challenging. Uh, and then they want analytics and workflow as a service. 
OK. So those are the, the demands of our customers. Uh, the demands of our staff, uh, we've got, you know, prior to this OpenStack project, we had um, a lot of different compute and storage silos, many different operating systems, different management practices. So we really saw OpenStack as a way to kind of maybe bring some of those practices together under one team and start to deploy things a little more cohesively. Uh, but you know, before OpenStack, you know, and, and even now, a lot of the integration between OpenStack components and legacy IT is done manually. All right, so um, you know, we really, really desired like a unifying platform. And we thought, well, gosh, this is like the one thing that'll rule them all, right? Okay, so let's take a look at um, where OpenStack fits in with some of these customer expectations. So, uh, data movement—that's um, something right now we don't we don't do a lot with OpenStack. This requires a lot of uh, big iron. Uh, really, really fast uh, networking. So we're not doing that with OpenStack yet. But the free compute and storage and the fast deployment turnaround, that's something that we can do with OpenStack. Um, I've got a little asterisk next to it because uh, that's to indicate that there's a caveat there, right? There, there still may be some other things you need, like a cloud management platform. If you guys remember from the AT&T uh, keynote a few minutes back, um, they built a lot of tooling around OpenStack. It was an impressive amount, actually. And some of that tooling they built takes care of uh, sort of the cloud management layer, right? So that, that's kind of what I'm talking about there. Uh, come on down here to utility IT and innovative IT. OpenStack can deliver on that too. And of course, uh, anything as a service, you know, um, OpenStack has options for you there. All right, um, our customer workload types, uh, you see the word platform listed there a lot. So we got a lot of platform type needs for data analysis. We, you know, they want everything from um, just websites, to software repos, to uh, big systems that they can develop software on and run analytics on. And they also need uh, a lot of big iron for um, high performance computing jobs as well. So let's see how OpenStack fits in with those workloads. Now it doesn't, doesn't hit all of them right now. So so, so far we're not, we're not doing so well on the one tool to rule them all. Uh, for, for folks who want bare metal for development and test, we can't do that with OpenStack just yet, but the ironic project uh, promises a lot there. We're looking forward to to deploy that. Uh, for platform for websites and software development and data analysis, OpenStack does great for that. It allows us to spin up uh, large VMs or small VMs for folks to, to satisfy those needs. But when you get down to the HPC side, we're not quite, using, we're not quite ready to use OpenStack for that yet. Um, but like I said a minute ago, that's what we're hoping that the Ironic project can deliver for us. Um, let me, go ahead. It's, it's a little bit of that, but just imagine you have hundreds or thousands of servers that you want to boot uh, immediately into, into some kind of HPC cluster. Um, you don't, yeah, you don't want to do virtual machines for that right now. You want to, you want to deploy that on bare metal. The low latency part there is the, is the kicker, right? So, um, you know, OpenStack is sometimes marketed towards organizations who want to do cloud native type deployments, right? Well, as we heard in the keynote, um, it's also an appropriate platform for sort of traditional IT as well, right? Um, anybody familiar with the, the Cloudcast? Podcast. Have you guys anybody heard that one? It's a great one. Check it out if, if, if you haven't heard it. Um, but there's a recent episode where they were talking about this, and this guy was saying that uh, IT outside of Silicon Valley, you know, a lot of organizations aren't doing cloud native applications, right? They, they, they just want, uh, if you think about the cattle versus pets analogy, they want pets, but they just want faster pets or bigger pets, right? So that, that's what we got at Oak Ridge. We got a lot of people wanting pets. And here's, here's a good example. So we've got data coming off of uh, scientific instruments. Um, lots of data, it gets sucked into OpenStack through some kind of workflow uh, virtual machine. Uh, these virtual machines can have a lot of cores, a lot of RAM. And it, it performs some kind of business logic on that data and then ships it out to compute clusters. Right? So right now, OpenStack is really managing kind of the central piece of this ecosystem, but not the edges just yet. May get there later. All right, so going back to the IT needs, let's see where OpenStack kind of fits in with some of those. It's enabled us to kind of uh, consolidate you know, the different operating systems we're deploying, different management platforms. It's kind of helped us uh, develop some shared management practices, and it's given us some freedom to do um, virtualization uh, VMs and containers. Uh, not so much on the bare metal side just yet. All right, so um, to kind of wrap things up here, uh, we talk about you, know, you need like an integrated solution stack. So here's just, a, here's just some of the things that uh, you may have to integrate your OpenStack deployment with that are sort of outside of OpenStack. These are services running outside. Um, 
so you might need some kind of cloud management platform. So there's Manage IQ or the, uh, the Red Hat supported version called CloudForms. That's something that we're, that we're investing in right now. This allows you to present uh, a better portal to your users. So that, and then you can kind of develop some workflow that knows which organization your user is coming from, what kind of resources they're allowed to spin up, and it allows you to maybe even charge back to your user's organization. Uh, it allows you to also deploy on different platforms like VMware and AWS as well, if, you, if, if hybrid cloud is something of interest to you. Um, data center virtualization, uh, you know, like I said, sometimes uh, pets can be shoehorned into OpenStack. Sometimes it's not ideal. Sometimes you just want to deploy to VMware instead. And uh, you know, CloudForms gives you the ability to do that. Uh, some other things, obviously file systems. A lot of our big file systems reside outside of OpenStack. We have hope that in the future we'll be able to, to deploy parallel file systems from within OpenStack, but we're just not quite there yet. Uh, IPAM, DNS, that's stuff that we right now we have to kind of manually integrate ourselves. And of course, identity like Active Directory and LDAP, we have to do that um, outside of OpenStack. All right, so here's just a quick, quick view of the different kinds of systems that we have uh, in our, our private cloud HPC project. We've got, uh, we've got some, some Cray hardware here running you know, graph analysis, uh, a lot of heterogeneous compute here. We've got some compute racks that are, that are uh, the same that we use in our Titan supercomputer. Uh, we also have our private cloud. We've got about a 4,000 core private cloud that's split among a couple different uh, versions of OpenStack, some in dev, some in production. Um, we have some sort of institutional clusters as well uh, that, we, that we manage uh, outside of OpenStack. As you can see, there's some of the technologies we use there on the right-hand column. So, you know, eventually we would like to expand OpenStack's reach, uh, you know, throughout this stack. Uh, but right now we have, you know, we have other software that we have to rely on. All right, so uh, that, that's it from, from Oak Ridge. Let me, let me turn it over to, to Richard here. Hello. Um, there's two names up here, Richard Haig, that's me, and Stephen Lowe, give us a wave at the back, Steve. Um, Steve's here as well. If you've got some questions afterwards, we're both around, so please come on across. You can't miss us in these shirts at all. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes, and I'm going to talk to you about um, Paddy Power Betfair's OpenStack journey. Um, if I start calling it Betfair, please excuse me. We're about day 70 into a merger, and I'm still trying to realign my brain into the new We Are Paddy Power Betfair. So I'll try and do my best. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes and talk you through why we chose OpenStack, where we thought the, uh, the value was, that, uh, was coming from, the problems we were trying to solve, why we chose Red Hat. Um, and then I'm going to go a bit more practical, and I'm going to talk you through what we've done and the phases of the project that we've uh, put in place to achieve that. Hopefully some questions afterwards. But first of all, um, a lot of you will never have heard of Paddy Power Betfair. Um, so let me give you a quick journey and just put into contact some of the engineering that we're doing. Um, Betfair, the second part of Paddy Power Betfair, um, was born about 10, 15 years ago. Um, offices across um, most of uh, places in Europe, but also in the USA as well. Um, we've got an engineering blog. Please go and have a look, betsandbits.com. There's some interesting stuff on there. But we're a very engineering-centric company. We've got about 800 software developers in a company of around about 2,000 people. But what makes us really special is the products. So we are an online gaming company, and we offer um, a betting exchange, which is very much like a financial exchange. It allows you to um, use the outcome of a sporting event to either bet or hedge, bet against the outcome. And we match you with other people who have maybe differing views from yourself. And then when the game is over, um, we bring those, uh, those two things together, and uh, the winner gets the winnings, and we take a small cut off the top. So that's the exchange model. And with the exchange model comes um, some engineering challenge around scale to get it working. So um, we have millions of users, but it's really the transaction parts. Our exchanges, you can hit it via an API, and with that comes high-frequency trading, um, bots trading against you. And as a result, we have about 135 million transactions per day at the DB level that that exchange will generate, um, coming from around about 3.5 billion API calls a day. So we have a very, uh, a very for us, kind of a large-scale engineering challenge, and we were trying to put OpenStack into this. There's some other things there, some fairly big log output, about 120,000 data points per second of monitoring that we do. Um, and we try and push out, we're trying to get faster on our deployments, and in fact, our OpenStack project was trying to help that. We're about 500 a week at the moment. This is across all of our software. This is pushing out stuff into our infrastructure layer. Um, I'd like to get that down to 500 a day, and it seems like we'll, we'll get there. And then, of course, recently we merged with Paddy Power to form a FTSE, we're actually about a FTSE 50, I think, but a FTSE 100 company um, with, a, with a large market capital, so um, it's all good. Right, that's Betfair, Paddy Power Betfair. Let's talk to you a bit about um, how our OpenStack project started. I2 is the internal code name for our OpenStack project. Um, 
it's not wonderfully inventive infrastructure, second generation, I2, it's the best we could come up with. But um, we put all of our time into the engineering, so that was fine. So <laughs> what, what were we trying to get? Um, we were trying to get more scale from our infrastructure. So what we had had done us pretty well so far, um, but it was getting a bit old. Um, it needed renewing, and we needed something that could pick up the pace um, and follow us on, you know, as the scale keeps growing year on year. We wanted to provision faster. If you're trying to get down to 500 releases a day, we had to provision really faster. Specifically, we'll talk a bit about some of the infrastructure stuff, but specifically, we wanted to get from it taking days, maybe weeks, to push a change out. Maybe you needed some new hardware underneath. Maybe you're trying to make a new cluster. Maybe you're trying to launch a new service. We're trying to go from those days and weeks into minutes. We're trying to get down to um, a deployment with all of its testing and everything in the you know, 10, 20, 30 minutes type range. We wanted to extend our continuous delivery into the infrastructure layer, and this was quite important because a lot of those delays in bringing a new service online is, I'd like some new servers, I'd like some holes punched in a firewall, I'd like to set up some load balancing, um, I'd like to set up a new network range. And all of that involved putting a ticket, and that ticket got lodged, and then someone in that engineering department picked up that ticket, and then they misunderstood what you asked, or maybe you asked it badly. Um, and then they did something that you didn't want, and then you had to go around again. And this is what led to the you know, days or weeks to start deploying some of this stuff. Now, if we're pretty good at putting continuous delivery around our software. What if we could take that and push that back into the hardware side as well and actually give our development community the ability to create their own network topology, to create their own storage amounts? That would make us go faster, and that's what we wanted. Um, and ultimately, it's to give the devs the control. We are, we're a regulated industry, so we couldn't just spin everything up in Amazon or a public cloud, but our devs all loved AWS or they all loved Azure or anything. We wanted to give them that same ease of use but in an environment that we could satisfy the regulators with. So, hence we came to our, our OpenStack private cloud. So we looked at our requirements. Um, pretty much on the top there, we wanted resilient DCs. I need to be able to lose a DC and carry on serving my customers. Um, and when the customers are hitting you thousands, tens of thousands times a second, I need to do that in a way that doesn't stop for one, two, five seconds, because people get very upset. Software-defined networking, we'd, we'd heard about this. We thought this, this might be a good step, but um, We'd never used it before, but we decided the only way we were going to get that speed of deployment, get that ease of use to the developers, was to try and go all in and put a software-defined networking in as well. And we'll talk a bit about some of that in a while. Centralized storage, we wanted to be able to carve that up. Commodity compute, I wanted to be able to rack and stack um, servers just anywhere and add them into that cloud. It's got to do virtual and bare metal. Some of our boxes do tens of thousands of transactions per second, and sometimes that one or that two or that three percent that that virtualization layer takes away counts. So we needed to be able to do something that we could put a bare metal solution for in the future. And with Ironic, we hope to do that in a few months' time. Rich API for automation because our developers are developers, and if you don't give them an API, they get very upset. They wanted to be able to use this. They wanted to be able to code against it. And internally on the OpenStack project, we're all developers as well. We also wanted to do this. We didn't want something that involved having to hit a portal or having to try and kind of fudge some work around. We needed rich APIs from everything we were putting in so we could instruct it as code. And of course, we wanted to scale for future growth, and we wanted to bake compliance in so that uh, the security model was baked in right the way through. So we had a choice. Here was our first choice. <laughs> Who do we choose? <laughs> so um, we, of course, looked around looking for people who could come and help us achieve this. And there's pretty much two camps that we found. There's the enterprise software vendors who will come and sell you a solution that will plug in and they will help you set up. And then there's the open source community. Paddy Power Betfair, the Betfair part, has a very long history of being involved with the open source community. We push some of our own stuff and we consume a lot. We help with a lot of the tooling and monitoring. I mean, from some other open source communities. So we're familiar with it, we're happy with open source, and we like the idea of having ones, tens, hundreds of thousands of people in a similar predicament as us, end users, people who care, committing back to that central code base and us being able to help as well. And you just don't get that with the enterprise side. So it was a fairly clear choice for us that if we could find an open source solution that worked, we would be interested in looking at it. And of course, this led to the birth of our of I2, our OpenStack project. Um, and uh, yeah, we, uh, we, we did um, a fair few rounds to try and find who would help us, and we settled on um, Red Hat and Nuage and ourselves, the kind of the three-way partnership. So Red Hat would provide us a KVM layer, they would provide us an OpenStack layer, they would provide us with some skills um, and some consultancy to help us get started. Nuage would provide us with our software-defined networking, and again, a lot of skills and training because this was new for us. And then the three of us together made a commitment to be true partners in this endeavor and to push forward in a way that we could hopefully commit some stuff back to the community, but also push the boundaries a little against what we may have been able to do previously on our own. 
So let's talk a little bit about how we've done some of that. Um, tooling, of course, is important. The hammer, the nail, the, the Swiss Army knife. This is our Swiss Army knife. So um, on top of our base OpenStack layer, we use the following tooling to give us that continuous delivery approach. Um, but unlike what we'd previously done, we didn't just want to use the CD approach for the software. So on the right is one of our apps, and that was fine. We were already seeding that. We got the operating systems and the pushing of that software down, that CDCI model. That was fine. But the stuff that we've got on the left here, the firewalls, the storage, the switching, the underlying networking, the actual x86 provisioning, we wanted to automate all of that. And we wanted to, I kind of coined the phrase, we wanted to do dot, dot, dot as code. Anything in this project, I wanted to be able to define and roll out and test and deploy and scale as code. And we hit every single one of these vendors that we've talked to, every single one of these problems with that mindset. If we can't automate it, if we can't deploy it, if we can't give it to our developers to be able to do that, then we need to think again and, and make that work. And we did make it work. We came up with, for us, what is a reference stack, um, a list of vendors that we put together to give us, uh, to give us uh, this project. Arista for switching um, for many reasons, but mainly because they would work with the software-defined networking from Nuage. If we had issues with that, remember again, this was new for us, they have their own software-defined networking approach, AOS, which we could use. And if that failed, we could just go back to dumb switching and we could try and automate that in other ways. So a, a, clear, a clear works with everyone type approach. Citrix for routing, um, we're familiar with it already. They have a virtualized version as well as a, as well as a hardware product, which meant that we can, I, I'm quite happy taking a virtualized solution over a physical solution, as long as the functionality and et cetera is the same. So we had a good way of putting that in place that allowed us to directly align our production and our pre-production systems so they are the same in as many ways as we could do. Uh, Nuage for our software-defined networking and our app-to-app -app firewalls. So instead of having to pin out of the network to a physical device on one side and then pin back in again, we can put mini firewalls, distrib distribute them around the edge of every hypervisor, and we can define and manage that policy across all of those hypervisors. So now we have a massive network performance improvement because we're not hopping in and out all the time. And in fact, empirically, we're seeing some massive performance improvements from doing this. Red Hat for OpenStack KVM, we've talked about those a bit. Um, Pure for all flash storage, so we wanted something fast. We've done a load of performance testing on Pure. I've got some great graphs somewhere that say here's some latencies and then they all flatline and it looks like we switched it off and it didn't flatline, it's just the performance improvement was so much we had to recalibrate all of our graphs. And we've chosen HP for x86 compute mainly for their involvement with uh, the Ironic project in the moment um, and uh, the hope that we can get a bare metal solution uh, which then leads on to a nice containerized solution as well. So trying to future plan a bit. Right, in the last few minutes, let me tell you about how we did it and the project. So there were four phases. First one was a proof of concept. Um, Betfair has a value called pace, which means we like doing things fast. Sorry, Paddy Power Betfair has a value called pace, which means we like doing things fast. So our PSC was going to be four weeks. And in that four weeks, we were going to build a, a two-zone open stack, uh, stack itself. And although it was only in one DC, we were going to try and line up pretty much the same switching, SDN, storage, compute, um, as we would finally want in production. And we were going to run a load of tests against that to see, does it work? Does what the guys said they were going to do on the RFP response actually work? Can we test it? And we did that. And after four weeks, we were able to successfully functionally and performance test that stack um, and sign off ready for the next stage. And the next stage was the pilot. Again, quite quick, we're at the end of that six months now. We just went uh, into production last week with our first two applications. But this was six months worth of work that was setting up the seeds to become our production estate. So we're now in both DCs. We're now building on the exact hardware that we're going to use, ready for the scale that we're going to use. Um, we've got all of the integration back with legacy because during this migration part, we're going to have some apps left over there. As we move some apps over here, they've got to be able to talk still. We've got to be able to continue to service the needs of our customers. All of that delivery tooling slide, we had to take it out of our heads and get it into code and actually make it work. We had to make use of those APIs in order to get the infrastructure to be dot, dot, dot as code. All of our monitoring services had to reach in and we had to make a decision early on. Did we go for a very, very early release OSP7 or did we stay on a much more safe and predictable six? Uh, and being us, we went for seven because we thought we might as well crack on. We want to take all of the uh, deployments that come out of uh, Red Hat OSP as well as some of the Nuage stuff. And as fast as they can push them, we want to be able to consume them. And part of that for us is we need to use things like OSD, the, the uh, director, and our automation to take these updates and be able to push them back in. So there's no point in us checking it out at the start of the pre-production phase by not doing this. So we went for seven uh, and it worked. So we're at phase three, and this is, if you were listening to this morning's keynote from Mirantis, this is the 90% of the problem. So the 10%, the technology, we've now got something that looks good, and now we've got to convince the people. 
and we've got to get them to move all their applications across. And for us, that's around 200 applications that they need to move, each with their own requirements, their own needs, their own teams who either believe in us or don't. Um, we have to bring them all across. So we're now in a massive drive to get, it's kind of the hearts and minds piece, to change the culture at Paddy Power Betfair, to give the teams, um, to give them this tooling and allow them to use it and get them to understand it and then to take advantage of that so they can speed up. And some of this was quite difficult. Some of those tools, um, some of these applications had not been designed for Active Active across different DCs. They've always been well connected. So for some of these, there's a bit of a technical challenge to onboard this as well, which means we really have to sell the benefits. Otherwise, the teams won't put the effort in to make that change. We had to get them to choose between that virtual and the physical. So although we are promising bare metal, we're not there yet. And previously, their example, their um, experience with virtualization may not have been great. Um, so we're having to try and show them that actually on the new stack, on this new hardware, with the reduced latency from the, from the, uh, the networking specifically, um, the all flash storage, et cetera, it is actually fairly performant. And in fact, what we're seeing empirically from about the last couple of months of testing is that it is a, a step up. We've gone from bare metal, proper old school bare metal machines in our previous estate to virtualized, running uncontended, but virtualized on the new one, and they are faster, 30% faster, 50% faster, you know, significantly faster. And we've gone for a self-selection um, uh, approach as well. So if you're a developer and you use AWS, you can decide the flavor of your machine. So why shouldn't you be able to do it on a private stack? You can decide your tenancy. You can decide whether you are going to put yourself across multiple or resiliency zones, et cetera. So why shouldn't we do the same in our own open stack? So we've done just that. Every development team gets ring-fenced hardware. We get rid of the noisy neighbor problems immediately. They get to decide exactly their split between pre-production and production in terms of what they want to put where. They get to decide exactly the contention if they're going to use virtualization or whether they want bare metal. They get to decide exactly if they're using virtualization, the flavors of those machines, how many vCPUs, how much RAM, how much storage, where is it mounted? Give them the choice. They're the responsible adults that we're employing, and we will give them the tools to make the decisions that suit their applications. So we're hoping all of this is going to lay out that doormat and allow them to come in and, and welcome and come on board. And we've probably got, I guess, another 12 months worth of work before we start, before we've moved all of those guys across. And then the fourth part of the project is, is decommissioning, taking the old, the old fighter plane that was awesome and unfortunately switching it off and throwing it away. But we have to do this because uh, as the new technology is coming in, we need space in our data centers, we need power and cooling and all that kind of stuff. But it's a project in itself to try and make sure that we clean up what we don't want to end up with, another data center crammed on side of the old data center and both of them still running. So that was it, that's the project. That's why we did it. Um, there's a couple of faces you might see wandering around. Steve, as I said, is at the back, I'm here. Robin's at the back from Nuage as well. Um, and a guy called Carl, I think, is not here from Red Hat, but or you, you really can't miss us. If you've got any questions either now or later in the day, please come and talk to us. I'm more than happy to talk about what we've done. We've also got a very, very technical session tomorrow um, midday, a guy called Stephen Armstrong, who's um, uh, led pretty much all of the technical side of the project. And then on Thursday morning at 9, Steve and myself are going to be elaborating a bit more about this culture change that we've undergone at Paddy Power Betfair and how that led and tied into this IT project. Thank you very much. Okay, everyone, well, I think we're right up on lunch. So just as a concluding remark, um, thank you very much to Richard and John. You know, it, it's, it's always amazing to me that we can take this same platform and apply it to application areas as different as uh, online betting exchange to scientific computing. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. Go have lunch.